My name is Linda Williams. I've been married to James for seven years. We have one elementary school aged daughter. I never thought it was possible for someone to be so cute that it wouldn't hurt to have them in your eyes. But now that I'm a mother, I realize it's true. However, as soon as it was revealed that our first child was a girl, Susan, my mill, immediately demanded we have another one. Apparently, girls aren't acceptable. That being said, James's family is from a long line of office workers, and there's nothing to inherit, so it's not necessary to emphasize it to that extent. Why don't you have a second child? That's what I'm told every time we visit the in-laws. I'm leaving it up to nature. If you leave it up to nature, it won't work. You absolutely have to have a boy. Dad. Even though I'm told that, James became incooperative with making another child once we had one. Even when I told him what she was saying, all he said was, just ignore her, she'll give up eventually. After about two years of marriage, the topic of living with Susan came up. And although I felt uneasy, I accepted it. Even though she won't show any love to her granddaughter. And as expected, I was blamed every day for something regarding the child. You still couldn't do it this month. You're really a useless wife. Why can't you have children? Don't you have any intention of having children? I can't possibly say that James isn't doing his part. It was around this time that I started to get fed up with being the only one attacked every day. And then Susan said something unbelievable. James is going to remarry with Jenny. Uh, remarrying with Jenny? Who's that? Haven't you heard it from James? No. She's James's mistress. What? James was busy playing games on his phone and didn't seem to be paying any attention to our conversation. I looked at Susan again. Is she senile? As I was pondering, Susan shouted. That's why you should leave right away. Um, Susan, James hasn't said anything about that, though. So even if you tell me to leave, Annoyed, Susan called James over and forced him to join the conversation. Even if I make him participate, there's no way he has a mistress. I thought. However, oh, about Jenny. Yeah, I'm going to remarry with her and divorce you. It's like saying, let's stop buying radishes and buy potatoes instead. What do you mean? What do I mean? What do I mean? Hurry up and move out. My new deal is coming. You explain yourself. But haven't you heard what mom said? My new wife is coming. So you're saying you cheated? It's not cheating. Yeah, he's serious. Serious. When did you even meet someone like that? Isn't that betrayal? That can't be helped, since you won't have a child. So because I won't have a child, he cheated. And have you known about it, Susan? Yeah, I did. That's why I've been telling you forever to have a boy. But you keep saying to leave it up to nature, and this is what happens. Here, the divorce papers. Sign them and submit them. James had them prepared in advance, apparently, and he took out the divorce papers from the drawer, placed them on the table, and went back to looking at his phone. How can you be playing games on your phone at a time like this? It's not that big of a deal. It's just signing divorce papers. Why is it so hard for you to understand? Susan keeps saying it's all about having children, but you don't even try to make one. Even if you say we need a boy, with your lack of cooperation in making one, we'll never have a child. Though, so, are you blaming James? Isn't it your fault? Why am I at fault? 
It's always the wife's fault if the husband isn't in the mood. That's how it goes. Huh? What's that supposed to mean? That's why I was against this marriage. Besides, you're too old. When you said you wanted to get married, you were 28. I was worried that you were too old to have children. And as expected. But we did have a child. We have a daughter. But that's not enough, is it? Girls eventually marry off. They are useless. People don't have children just to be useful. Well, aren't you cheeky? You know, as you get older, being cheeky just isn't cute anymore. That's terrible. I've always listened to what James said. I came here without opposing to keep the peace in the family. You know, that's what's boring about you. Huh? Boring? Well, you know, no matter how much I hate it, I just have to say yes dear and listen obediently that kind of thing is just boring you know when it comes to that my girlfriend she's got her own opinions you know i think that's what's good about her what's going on accepting living with susan not opposing anything she says all for the sake of james is that boring to him and, the way things are going, we won't be able to have a boy, right? I don't have any expectations for you anymore. I mean, you're 35 already. No matter how hard you try, it's impossible. Besides, even James would prefer a younger woman, right? Susan said that as if she were mocking me. And I remembered. I've been enduring being looked down upon like this by Susan ever since I got married. Being told I'm a bad daughter-in-law compared to the neighbor's daughters-in-law, being criticized for my cooking being awkward. When my kid made noise, I got scolded for not being able to discipline her despite my age. Even when I asked James for help, he never sided with me. What was the point of enduring all this for seven years? And to top it off, James's affair. When did the affair start? And who is this Jenny person? Since when? Let's see. It's been about a year since we got married. Wait. Six years ago? That's around the time I gave birth. Yay. Well, you know, as mom said, Younger women's skin is better, so. How much worse can it get? Where did you meet her? Oh, it was through mom's introduction. Huh, Susan's. Yeah, she used to work part-time at a store I frequented, and I thought she'd be just right for James, so I approached her. Does that person know you're married? Oh, yeah, she knows. But she's saying she's fine with it if I get divorced. She was having an affair knowing you were married. How old is she? You're so interested, but you're the loser here. So why does it matter? See, my husband was taken away. Don't I have the right to know? Fine. She's 30. You're 10 years older than her, aren't you? That's why she'll probably give birth to healthy babies. So, did Susan encourage the affair with that person just to have babies? Well, after giving birth, they can just live together as parent and child. I'm not thinking it's just about having babies. As proof, I'm telling you to leave because you can't give birth. That's just... The younger one wants to get married too. All you have to do is leave. Come on, hurry up and write it. I was urged to write the divorce papers. I couldn't think anymore as they kept telling me to hurry up. At that moment, I saw my daughter with an anxious expression in the corner of my eye. Standing at the entrance of the room, she was quietly watching us. My daughter's watching. Oh. It's not good to talk about this in front of a kid. Let's talk about it another day. 
Po, it's fine. It saves you the trouble of explaining to her. Besides, if you divorce, she has to understand her parents' divorce sooner or later. That's... it'll hurt her, won't it? It's okay. This kind of thing happens in every household. Parents' divorce is normal nowadays. I inadvertently stared at James's face. What are you saying? You don't care about our kid? Thinking that, I began to feel foolish for clinging to being with such people. Then, another part of me appeared, saying, Just write it and break up already. And I picked up the pen and signed the divorce papers. Here, I've signed it. Is this okay? Seeing that and throwing the pen aside, Susan took the divorce papers and looked at them closely. Yeah, this is fine. Now, please leave. What? You're divorced, so it's weird to stay in the same house, right? Even a new wife wouldn't like that, so please leave. That's... it's too soon to say that. Well, we want you to leave as soon as possible. But I have a kid. It's not that easy. Oh, my. I thought signing meant you were prepared for something like that. Yet, you seem completely unprepared. Well then, you have a week to get out. Mom, you're okay with that, right? Well, I guess there's no helping it. As soon as I signed, it felt like I was erasing the past seven years with an eraser. I felt a chill as I led my daughter by the hand into the bedroom. So then, James, humming a tune, stormed out of the house as if he was off to see another woman. Susan, apparently deciding to follow suit, left immediately afterward, and I heard the sound of the front door closing. In an instant, the once lively house fell silent, with only the hum of the refrigerator motor, which seemed oddly cold. My daughter clung to me, crying. It's okay, there's nothing to worry about. We're not going to end things like this. Yes, we'll start everything anew from here. As I reassured myself, I picked up my phone and made a call. Within a week, I had finished packing and arranged for a truck. There were piles of cardboard boxes stacked up in the foyer. Upon seeing them, James and Susan seemed delighted. So, you're finally leaving. Well, it took quite a while. And there are so many cardboard boxes. I hope you're not planning to take the appliances with you. Can't you see? Not a single appliance is missing. Well, that's annoying, but I guess it's better safe than sorry. Since there are also our daughter's things, it's understandable. It just shows how much money I've spent on them all these years. You've been so wasteful. That's true. I wasted money on people who were of no use. I won't be sending any forgotten items back, so don't even ask. I'll be fine. Well, that's good. This will make the house feel more spacious. I was feeling suffocated before. As the truck arrived and we loaded the belongings, the two of them sat on the living room sofa, Susan turning on the TV. Even when I asked James for help, he was glued to his phone playing games. What kind of people are they? Even at the very end of saying goodbye to their precious daughter or granddaughter, they maintain this cold attitude. There was a slight pang in my heart, but thanks to this, even that feeling disappeared. With everything now over and a new beginning ahead, I felt refreshed. As for my daughter, she watched me instructing the movers while clutching her stuffed animal. Her face still betrayed her anxiety, tears welling up in her eyes. It's okay. There's really nothing to worry about. With that thought in mind, I gently stroked her head. Once all the luggage was loaded onto the truck, James and Susan came to the front door. 
Is it done? Yes, it's finished. Ah, uh, finally leaving, huh? Now I can invite her over. Yes, finally. Thank you for everything. Yeah, yeah, just hurry up and leave. Since this is our farewell, and considering everything that's happened, could you escort us to the truck? Huh, why should we do that? We've been a family for seven years, so I think it's only right. It's our way of saying goodbye. Goodness, you're so formal about the strangest things. Just leaving is enough for us. Yes, that's why I'm asking for your help to the truck. I have no sentimental attachment either. Mom, it's fine. That's it. Oh, really? Well, if James says so, then I guess it can't be helped. With that, Susan slipped on the sandals by the entrance and headed outside. Following suit, James put on the remaining pair of sandals and stepped out. I took my daughter's hand, and together we stepped outside the front door, giving a form nod to the movers. Then the mover said, Sir, please get in. Huh, why should I get in? It's fine, Mom, please get in too. Wait, why should I get in? You need to get in. Once you're in, you'll understand. Wait a minute, I don't want to. What should we do? The mover pushed them both onto the truck. Though they resisted, they realized that making a scene would attract neighbors. Concerned about their reputation, they reluctantly boarded the truck. James, what is this? I have no idea, but causing a scene now would just be embarrassing. Let's just get on for now and figure it out later. That's true. It'll be fine if you can come back later. I said that, then closed the truck door and let my daughter wave to them. The mover nodded, started the engine, and began driving the truck. My daughter looked puzzled as she watched the truck drive away, but I smiled at her and said, how about we have a snack? Once inside the house, I laid out some snacks I had bought to calm my daughter down. It was a smart cake, not really fitting for the occasion. Let's have some. While eating the cake, I told my daughter that her father and grandmother had moved out. She must have thought she was going to leave this house too. She was surprised by the sudden turn of events, but I reassured her that everything was going to be okay. Then, her smile returned. It seems she didn't feel sad about getting rid of her overbearing father and cold grandmother. Even at her young age, she seemed to understand who was at fault. About an hour later, just as I had expected, I received a call from James. Hey, what's going on? Oh, have you arrived already? Yeah, I have. But isn't this her apartment? Yes, it is. Since she wanted to live together, I sent you over to her place. You should be grateful. Grateful, like hell I am. And how the hell do you even know about this place? It's simple. You can find out with a detective. A detective? Yes, I needed the address to send you away. You're the one leaving. I never said I was leaving. From today on, you'll be living there with her. It's great. You get to live with her so soon. What? Are you kidding me? I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious. Why the hell? My home is there. That's right. That is our home. What the hell are you doing messing around like this? It seemed like she was using a speakerphone, and Susan's voice was also audible, which was irritating. No, you're mistaken. This house is my home. You're kidding. It's you who's acting ridiculous, isn't it? 
Introducing a woman to my husband and encouraging adultery. It's amazing you could pull off such a stupid thing. I'm not talking about that right now. Didn't I tell you to leave when you get divorced? So it's obvious that it's you, the ex-wife, who will leave. Could it be that you haven't been told anything? What do you mean I haven't been told anything? Susan, why are you shouting here? You're disturbing the neighbors. Shut up. The movers unloaded everything from the truck and piled up boxes in front of the apartment. If we leave it like this, all your stuff will get wet from the dew. If you don't want that, then come here soon. I don't think I need to go since everything in those boxes belongs to you guys. What did you say? That can't be true. Susan continued to hysterically scream. Susan, it's embarrassing. From now on, if you're going to live there, the neighbors will think a crazy old lady has moved in. Who are you talking about? Anyway, please live there from today. We're strangers to each other now. No, we're leaving. We'll kick you out of that house. You can't do that. If you enter the house without permission, I'll sue you for trespassing. What a woman. You're the crazy one. James can confirm this. Why don't you ask him? What are you talking about? It's about whose house this is. There's no need to ask. James said he bought the house after he got married. Even though it was used, it was clean enough. That's why I moved in with him. Oh my, what a big lie. But someone who's comfortable lying even when having an affair would certainly tell such lies, right? What do you mean? Well, actually, this house was built by my parents before I got married. My parents passed away and I was living alone. But when I said I didn't want to leave my childhood home when getting married, James said, then let's live here. After getting married, when James said you would live with us, I thought it was okay since it's a spacious house. Lies. James said he bought the house used. That's why we decided to live together. Susan, think about it. How could James afford such a big house with his salary and moving in right after marriage? Even paying for the wedding was a stretch for him. But that's... So, this house is mine. You have no right to claim it. Why don't you ask James? James, what's going on? From the phone, trembling Susan's voice could be heard. But James seemed to be playing games as usual, pretending not to hear. James, stop playing games and answer. When it's inconvenient, James tends to ignore. Seems quite inconvenient now that his lies are exposed. James, say something. Are you just going to let her make a fool out of you? Fine. As James's faint voice came through, it seemed like it was now him speaking instead of Susan. Sure, it was your parents' house, but I'm the one living here now, so it's mine. Like a child's opinion. You could live here because of our marital relationship, right? That's why I allowed you to live here. It's the same for your mother, isn't it? Well, that's true, but... Even so, you lied about buying it yourself. Even if you say that, it doesn't become yours. The ownership of this house belongs entirely to me. But if we divorce, we'll split the assets, won't we? That's true. It's never been mentioned until now. But you see, I inherited this house before marrying you. Even if I inherited it after marriage, it's still my own inheritance. Which means, it's not shared property. Too bad. So there's no need to split it. That's a lie. If you think it's a lie, why don't you investigate? I'm just stating what I heard from the lawyer. Upon hearing James's skeptical voice, Susan seemed to think she would lose if she continued, 
So she spoke up again. But what about appliances and furniture? There are things to split, right? Typically, yes. But all the appliances and furniture in our house were used by both parents. Of course, some things were bought new. Like that $30 toaster. Do you want it? Shall we give you $15? Or do you want to give me $15 and take the worn out one? I don't want it. Oh, the junk James brought when we got married is packed in boxes. And all your stuff is also in boxes. Originally, most of them were going to be thrown away. But since you do seem to cherish things, I didn't want to hear complaints about throwing them away. So, I packed everything to ease your mind. So that's how it is. Thanks to that, the moving costs were no joke. It was quite expensive. But since all the appliances are mine, it's a good thing the moving costs weren't there. So that's why the movers charged so much, that amount. It was expensive indeed. I was surprised when I saw the estimate. But since it's money I don't need to pay, I didn't mind. But there's still so much. Oh yes, absolutely. Most of them were practically garbage. Torn socks, worn out sneakers, raggedy t-shirts. You should have just thrown those stuff away. Well, when I asked if I should throw them away, what did you say? What a waste. You said that, didn't you? You shouldn't just throw things away like that. That's what you said, right? And yet, you never wore any of them and kept buying new things. So, I couldn't bring myself to throw them away. Any complaints about that? And now you're telling me to live in this cramped apartment. I can't say whether it's cramped or not. But you wanted to live with her, didn't you? Isn't that great? With all this stuff, it's impossible to live in an apartment. Well, that can't be helped, can it? You and Susan are the ones who got involved in an affair. Hey, come on. That's just cruel. The divorce went through, so I have nothing to do with it anymore. And this isn't the end. There's more to come, so be prepared. Huh? What do you mean them's more? James and Susan were surprised by my words, but I laughed and hung up the phone. Later on, I received a frantic call from James. It seems he's being scolded by his mistress. What's the meaning of this? I didn't agree to you coming over suddenly. I didn't expect things to turn out like this either. She just dumped our stuff and us here. Then take them back. It's a lot of stuff. It's not that easy. I didn't ask for this. When your ex-wife moved out, we were supposed to live in your spacious house. Sure, but it's not that simple anymore. Why not? That house is your house, isn't it? Can't you just reclaim it? Well, you see, actually, it's in my ex-wife's name. What? But you said it was in your name. Yeah, it is. But hum, there are some complications. I thought if we were divorcing, she should at least have the house, you know, to be fair. This is ridiculous. What about me? How am I supposed to live in this cramped space? And look at all these cardboard boxes we have. Yeah, I get that, but... So, does that mean we can't live in that house? Yay, well, that's how it is. Then buy a house, if that's not possible. Then rent a spacious apartment right away, with your salary. Well, hum, that might be difficult. You're so annoying. It's no use making such a racket in this tiny apartment. Since it's come to this, we have no choice but to live here. What? What are you talking about? Are you seriously considering living here? Then, you should pay two-thirds of the rent. Huh, why would I do that? Of course, you brought your mother along without even being married yet, 
And now you're saying you'll live here together. It's ridiculous. If we're living together, you should pay rent for each person. And also, food and utility expenses, we should split those two. Why are you so cunning? I'm cunning. You're the one trying to live here without paying anything. Most of these boxes are yours, right? I don't even know what's inside. But do you really need this much stuff? There might even be stuff in here that's unnecessary. I almost want to charge you for the storage space these boxes are taking up. They're taking up almost all the space. I can't believe you'd say something like that. Marriage hasn't even happened yet, and we're already in a battle between wife and mother-in-law. I don't even want to go back to the apartment anymore. Oh, really? Doesn't sound like fun. Don't joke. My mom says she doesn't want to live with a woman like Jenny, and Jenny says she'll never accept mom as her mill. It's so difficult that the neighbors are complaining about the noise. I thought that would happen. I've almost lost my temper living with that mill. But I endured it for James's sake. But why should you have to endure it when you're not even married yet? And on top of that, then's alimony from you. What do you mean, alimony? And child support too? We divorced because of your affair. It's only natural to ask for alimony. And since I'll be raising your child, it's only natural to ask for child support too. Days, no way I can afford that. If I pay that, I won't even be able to move out. Then don't pay. In that case, I'll have to hire a lawyer. But if I do, be prepared for it to get even more expensive. The lawyer I'll hire is quite skilled. And I think I'll also bill you for the liar's fees. Why? Because the liar's skilled. That's, please, don't make such demands. From behind James, who spoke in a tone akin to a complaint, came the shouting voices of his mistress and Susan. After that, he never paid the alimony or child support. Realizing this wouldn't work, I eventually decided to hire a lawyer. The lawyer, as reputed, demanded lump sum alimony and secured a promise to pay child support every month. But James was irresponsible. He even thought about not paying. So, I added a condition that if he didn't pay for even one month, his salary would be garnished. Of course, I also demanded compensation from his mistress and ordered her to pay it all at once. Then his mistress seemed furious, wondering why she had to pay such a thing, and another battle erupted. Jenny blamed Susan for being the one to initiate contact but in contrast, Susan thought Jenny was the one to be blamed, knowing James was married, chose to be his mistress. Finally, the mistress, unable to tolerate being with such an old hag any longer, thrust a demand for compensation onto James and expelled both of them. The two who were kicked out seemed to have stayed at a gaming cafe for a while, but Susan kept saying that this wasn't doing the trick for their fatigue, so they somehow managed to contract a cheap apartment. However, it turned out to be a rather cool room with a cemetery next door. But then again, it's easy for you to say that since you don't live there, while Susan, who spends all day in the apartment, kept complaining about feeling queasy. He seemed to have tried to appease Susan by saying she could sleep in a bed, but apparently her hysteria was so abnormal that even when he came home tired, there was no room for relaxation. Under such circumstances, it was impossible to maintain a normal mental state, and eventually, James also suffered from a mental illness. He's now depressed and unable to work or go outside. It's tough not getting child support, but considering how he neglected me and our daughter, I hope he suffers as much as possible. On the other hand, with James and Susan gone from the house, 
my daughter and I are living peacefully together. Our lives are not threatened by anyone and are filled with peace and happiness. I'm praising the decision to divorce. The hospital is within walking distance. Haha. <laughs> John said so as he got Olivia out of the car. Isabella sat in the passenger seat and John in the driver's seat as I was startled by the suddenness. Then, off we go. Since I've made up with Tim, we're going to enjoy a family trip to Spain. Just the three of us. She said so and they drove away. What a situation. I was so taken aback by what had just happened in front of me that I was lost for words. I'm sorry. I came back to myself with Olivia's scratchy voice. At that point, nothing else mattered, and I immediately called a cab to take Olivia to the hospital. That was all I could focus on. And it was anger that I would never forgive. At that moment, John and his parents surely never imagined I would take such bold action. I vowed revenge in my heart against John and Isabella for neglecting me and Olivia. My name is Emma. I am 42 years old and work as a nurse. My husband, John, is 45, just a regular office worker. Our daughter, Olivia is a quiet child who just turned 10 and loves reading by herself at home or during school breaks. Due to my job, I hardly had male friends, and I never even went to mixers because I was focused on my career. Then, just after I turned 30, my friend insisted on going to a singles party because she was nervous about attending alone, and although I wasn't interested, I agreed to accompany her. That's where I met John. He joked about how he had lived for his work and had missed the chance to marry. I felt a strange connection to him, seeing my own situation reflected in his, and we ended up exchanging contact information. Talking to him, I found John to be a kind man, with a stable job and income. He understood my irregular nursing schedule, which undoubtedly drew me to him. John felt the same way. I want to know more about you, Emma. I was genuinely pleased, he said. Thus, we began to draw closer to each other, starting a relationship with marriage in mind, and I got married at the age of 31. I got pregnant with Olivia almost immediately after our wedding, and gave birth the next year at 32. We both agreed that one child was enough, so we didn't try for more. Now, ten years have passed. A sinister shadow was looming over me. One day, John blurted out, My mom is coming to stay with us from tomorrow. Please take care of her. His sudden declaration of cohabitation took me by surprise. What do you mean? All of a sudden, I'm not ready for her. I asked him the reason with a surprised voice. According to John, it seemed that Tim and Isabella had a fierce argument, and in the heat of the moment, Isabella had declared, I'm leaving, and started packing. Naturally, the only place for Isabella, a woman in her 60s, to go was to her only son, John. That's why he suddenly announced that she would be coming to our house the next day. Honestly, I was opposed to living with Eve and my own parents, let alone my mill. Do we have to take her in just because she had a fight with her husband and decided to leave home? Is she ignoring our situation? Please, think it over. However, John seemed to dislike my protest, responding with annoyance. You hate living with my mom that much. Uh, I never thought you were so cold. I couldn't say how much I disliked the idea. John's face was too intimidating, and I felt overwhelmed. I swallowed the words I wanted to say, and instead glared at him. Seeing that I couldn't talk back, John looked smug and continued. Um, don't bother resisting from the start. Just get the room ready for mom, 
will you? First off, since this place is rented, we need permission from the landlord or property management if someone else is moving in. The lease is in my name since I get a housing allowance, so naturally, I'm the one who has to handle it. Plus, we live in a two-bedrooms apartment. One room is used by Olivia, and the other is our bedroom. Sorry, but we don't have a spare room available right now, do we? John casually dropped this bombshell. Why not just move Olivia and have her study in the living room? That way, you can keep an eye on her doing her homework. I think it's a good idea. She's still in elementary school. She doesn't need a room of her own. Well, that's the plan. Olivia will stay in the living room for a while. I felt dizzy hearing such an outrageous argument. How can you say something like that? Are you prioritizing your mom over your own daughter? Huh, I didn't exactly say that, but I do owe my mom for raising me. So, yeah, that's it. Despite my repeated objections, it didn't get through to John, and as soon as Olivia returned, he was told. Your room will be used by Grandma from now on. So, clean it out right now. I rushed to stop it, but she, saying it was okay, started moving her things to the living room. Watching her from behind, my heart ached, and I felt my hatred for him swelling. Lately, John hasn't been contributing to household chores or finances, and he's been coming home late. I had been putting up with it because Olivia is still only 10, but today's behavior seemed to be the last straw. The next day, as expected, in the late afternoon, Isabel arrived and immediately screamed. What is this dump? You expect us to live here, John. Are you out of your mind? This is insane. Isabella's arrival coincided with our neighbor's return home who looked at us curiously, prompting me to hurriedly greet them. When I contacted the property management, they said no special procedures were needed for a short-term stay, just a report was enough. So, honestly, I hoped Isabella would return home within two weeks, if possible. However, my hopes were dashed. First, when I saw the large suitcase Isabella brought, I was depressed indicating she planned to stay for at least a month, which was disheartening. Isabella entered our apartment without any regard for me, looking around as if inspecting everything. Then she went straight to the fridge and started criticizing. What's this? The fridge is almost empty. Do you think John and Olivia can get proper nutrition from this? Really, Emma? You're hopeless. I was supposed to go grocery shopping today, but Isabella's sudden arrival meant I had to tidy up immediately after work and couldn't find the time. This is when takeout should be considered. Lately, John has been preferring takeout over my cooking, constantly making sarcastic remarks, and I was defiant at his words. Isabella, should we order some takeout today? I asked her with a forced smile, but she snapped at me again. What? No, I don't allow takeout food. A mother and wife who doesn't cook is worthless. Go shopping right now and make sure you can prepare a main dish, five side dishes, soup, and dessert. She threw a shopping basket and bag at me and slammed the door shut. Immediately, I could hear the TV blasting, and she laughing loudly from inside, and I sighed deeply, not knowing how many times I had done so. One hour later, after shopping, I returned and was shocked to see that Olivia had been doing her homework in the living room, with Isabella looming over her like a demon while I was away. Whenever she made a mistake, Isabella would shout, that's wrong, or why don't you get it, such a bad child, ha, huh? I wonder who she takes after. I quickly intervened. 
She's just started learning this recently. Even elementary students have foreign language and programming classes now. You know, you can't judge by old standards. I defended Olivia and admonished Isabella, but my words fell on deaf ears. Well, I wish she had taken over this smart John Jean. She implied disdain for both me and Olivia. Seeing Olivia's downtrodden face, I immediately comforted her. It's okay, Olivia. You just work at your own pace. I glared fiercely at Isabella. But it didn't seem to affect her. She just got angry at my response and started to greedily eat snacks. And a week has passed since Isabella and we lived together. I was so fed up that I confronted John. Look, I can't ignore this any longer. Do something about your mom. I can handle the snide remarks, but this is just too much for Olivia. John retorted with a look of displeasure and a sharp tone. Why, you should be grateful she's helping around the house. Besides, it's Olivia's fault for not being able to study, right? She's the real victim here, taking after her not-so-smart mother. That really ticked me off, and I couldn't hold back any longer. Usually, I would end the conversation and walk away, but as a mother, my heart ached hearing my daughter being spoken of like that. And Isabella, she only acted sweet for John. When I was busy, she would come over with a big smile, saying, Don't worry, Emma, just sit down and have some tea. I'll take care of everything. She pretended to be helpful. But in reality, she did nothing, leaving me to do all the work later. Is John blind to this reality? John, who believed that Isabella was helping me, I took my old haunting complaints out on him. So it's clear, your top priority isn't Olivia, it's Isabella. Are you okay with your daughter being criticized harshly by Isabella? I couldn't stand it even if my own mother did that. John provocatively laughed. Yeah, my mom is always right. Well, you're just a nursing school grad unlike me, a college grad. So, no wonder Olivia can't excel in studies or sports. Poor thing. At that moment, I felt something snap inside me. But thinking it childish to lash out impulsively, I replied with a laugh. All right, I get it. A month later, Olivia, who usually wakes up early even on weekends, stayed curled up in bed, so when I asked her, she complained of feeling unwell. Remembering the recent epidemic at school, I measured her temperature. It was 102 degrees Fahrenheit. I rushed to tell John, only to find him inexplicably getting ready to leave. I was puzzled, and John said as a matter of course. Oh, I forgot to tell you, but I'm off to Spain with my dad and mom. I hadn't heard anything about this trip, but at that moment, I didn't care. We only have one car, which is mine, since John commutes by train. Ignoring John, I tried to take Olivia to the hospital, which is open even on weekends, but then John and Isabella showed up with their suitcases and dropped the bombshell. The hospital is within walking distance. John said so as he got Olivia out of the car. Isabella sat in the passenger seat and John in the driver's seat as I was startled by the suddenness. Then... Off we go. We've made up with Tim, so we're going to enjoy a family trip to Spain. Just the three of us. She said so, and they drove away. Stunned by the sudden events, I was brought back to reality when Olivia, with a raspy voice, said, I'm sorry. Suddenly, nothing else mattered, and all I could think about was calling a cab immediately to take her to the hospital and it was anger that I would never forgive. At that moment, John and his parents surely never imagined I would take such bold action. I vowed revenge in my heart against John and Isabella for neglecting me and Olivia.
Two and a half hours later, my phone vibrated relentlessly with calls from John. I didn't want to answer, but ignoring it wouldn't change anything. Reluctantly, I answered the phone with a heavy sigh. Then, before I could speak, John screamed in a voice like a shriek. Please, help me. I wondered what had happened, and it turned out he had a car accident on the way to the airport. Actually, my car is a manual transmission. John has a license for manual vehicles, but I guess he forgot how to drive one since he commutes by train. But in front of Isabella, he couldn't admit he wasn't confident driving a manual anymore. Of course, I have proper car insurance, and I made sure it covered John as a potential driver. So, there's nothing illegal about John driving. But it's his own fault he crashed since he took the car without my consent. While I was thinking this, John blurted out, if I deal with the accident, I'll miss the flight. It's your car, so you handle it. It's all because this car is so hard to drive. It guzzles gas. What an old beat up car. He started to complain, but it just sounded like the whining of a loser. I finally reached a point of not caring and said with a smirk, so what? You knew my car was manual, right? You took it forcefully. The accident responsibility lies with the driver, not the owner. Hit a guardrail, didn't you? Then, you'll be paying for the car repairs and the guardrail damage out of your pocket. I told him that and hung up. The phone kept ringing persistently, but I was in the hospital. Olivia had something different from the epidemic she needed for their tests, and we were waiting for those results. I didn't have the luxury to deal with such selfish people. Ignoring the calls, I then heard the notification sound of an email. Checking my phone, expecting it to be another message from John, my eyebrows furrowed at the sender's name. I fought even had Isabella and Tim sided with John, but while Isabella was just sending desperate pleas for help, Tim asked, what happened? Finding it odd, I replied only to Tim, and discovered a surprising fact. Tim had no idea about the Spain trip, and was enjoying his day with his lawn bowling friends. Then Isabella called him about the accident, asking to be picked up. She just kept saying, just come, without giving details, thinking it was a prank until John also reached out for help. And Tim fought me and Olivia were with them, so he was worried about me and sent me an email. Why didn't you reply to them and only message me? I immediately called Tim and asked, and he gave an unexpected response. Just a hunch. Besides, we are currently separated, so the thought of dealing with her made me not want to. Did my wife cause any trouble? Tim wasn't even aware that Isabella was staying with us, thinking she had just gotten herself into trouble due to her selfishness. I held my breath and slowly told him what had happened. She is currently staying with us, she said, including you, we're going to Spain for a family trip today. After I mentioned what they did to Olivia and me right before leaving, Tim fell silent. After a while, he finally spoke in a voice lower than I'd ever heard. That's unforgivable. His voice was so low and gravelly, unlike anything I'd ever heard, it sent shivers down my spine. Thirty minutes after finishing the call with him, I was finally summoned by the doctor to discuss her condition. It seems she has acute gastroenteritis. We were told she would need to stay in the hospital for a bit. Relief washed over me, but at the same time, I was consumed with guilt for the stress I had caused her. We were fortunate to get a private room. Olivia, how are you feeling? We got a private room, so rest easy, okay? I tried to sound cheerful when talking to her, but she looked guilty and apologized. 
I'm sorry. It's my fault you had a bad time. And now my studies will be delayed. I'm so sorry. So sorry. I rushed to her side and hugged her gently. I'm not raising you because you're good at studies, but because you're my precious child. Live your life as you are. Later, Tim, who had arrived at the hospital, contacted us, and Olivia, always a grandpa's girl, was delighted. Tim seemed happy to see Olivia after a long time, and they starting a pleasant conversation. He mentioned seeing in the newspaper that she had won a prize in an art contest, and boasted about it to his lawn bowling friends, which led to a pleasant time. Then, an unwelcome call came through. It was John and Isabella. We missed the flight because you didn't help us. We can't cancel, so it's like we've lost the full amount of the trip. You owe us for all three tickets. Isabella chimed in. We had the chance to make up with Tim. I was outside the hospital talking to them, but their voices were so loud it was as if they were on speaker. Then, Tim, who had followed me, casually remarked, Wait, I wasn't invited to any trip to Spain. It seems there's a third person involved, but it's neither Olivia or Emma, and certainly not me. So, who could it be? John and Isabella probably never imagined Tim would be there. They started to get nervous. Hey, why is Dad at Emma's place? I could imagine his voice weakening over the phone. I pointed out that the two were lying and that Tim had seen through them, which is why he contacted me instead. Then Isabella began to make excuses. Well, it was a lie that we invited Tim. So it's just the two of us going on this trip. Don't pry any further. It was as if she was asking to be doubted. Trying to contain my laughter, I counted. Oh, really? Because I just checked, and the reservation site clearly says three people. At that, the two of them lost their words. They suddenly fell silent. Recently, Olivia told me that Isabella had been using my computer while I was away. She didn't know the details, but mentioned something about searching for Spain. So, I logged into my travel booking site out of curiosity and found it a reservation for three people made by Isabella under my name. I had already confirmed the charges on my credit card. So, the financial damage was mine. Thinking John absurd for complaining about cancellation fees. The evidence of a third person in the reservation was clear, so I pressed on who that might be. Still, John continued to deny. Well, it seems like Mom got the number of people wrong. It was supposed to be just the two of us. Is that so? John sighed, relieved. Anyway, the trip is off, right? So, come to the location I'm about to tell you. We'll discuss what to do next there. I said that and hung up. I left Olivia in her hospital room and waited with Tim for their arrival at a nearby chain restaurant. When they showed up, John inexplicably got angry. The guardrail damages aren't covered by insurance, so you deal with it. I was appalled at his audacity. What, you hit it it's your fault for being careless. You pay for it, as I said before, what nonsense are you spouting? After glaring fiercely, John's face contorted as he stepped back slightly. Then Isabella spoke up. Never mind that. So, Emma, what's this talk about? Eager to get to the point, I thanked Isabella in a way for steering us there, and said, Upon checking, the dash cam showed Isabella in the passenger seat and John driving, along with an unknown young woman in the back seat. The moment I spoke, their faces contorted. In fact, the dash cam in my car is quite high-tech. It allows me to check the footage in real time through an app on my smartphone. 
I could access past footage immediately from my phone. My car is a pretty good model, so I had taken strong security measures in case of theft. I never imagined that these precautions would end up revealing John's infidelity as well. So, you lied about going with your parents, planning to take your mistress instead. Thanks for leaving such clear evidence. Contrary to my smile, I could see their faces turning pale. They probably thought they could destroy the evidence by removing the SD card. I revealed that I had been suspicious of his behavior and quietly investigating any evidence of his affairs since the day I started to doubt him. I was planning to confront him with divorce once I had solid evidence, but then Isabella moved in, they were going to Spain, and Olivia got seriously ill. I was busy, but I had been considering divorcing John from the start. Tim, who had been silent for a long time, said to them who had nothing to say. Like mother, like son, huh? Isabella, you can't say much because you're cheating with a younger man yourself. John, unaware of this, looked at her in shock. Isabella blushed in front of the eyes of people around her at a chain restaurant. At your age, you got seduced by a much younger man and lavished him with gifts and fell in love. Save your daydreams for bedtime. Tim, usually quiet and not prone to shouting, was visibly angry. This is the reason why Isabella left home. After all, she deserved it. Yet, she made excuses, trying to ship the blame to Tim, showing no shame for intruding into our home. Disgusted, I looked at Isabella with scorn. I don't intend to meddle in your affairs, but John, you're obviously getting divorced from me, and I'll take custody. Child support and alimony are a given, along with compensation for the accident damages and the Spain trip costs. Be prepared for all, of course, I will make a claim to your cheating partner. Immediately, John, without regard for the public eye, started apologizing. Okay, okay, I'll pay everything. I'll cover the compensation to the other party too. Just don't contact her, please. The reason he gave was astonishing. Apparently, John's affair partner was the daughter of an important client at his company, and she was completely unaware of his marital status. Isabella liked his affair partner because she was wealthy, and without any shame, Isabella invited her, saying, since we have the chance, let's go on a trip together. The naive young woman took it seriously and even praised John for his driving of the manual car. This was confirmed by the dash cam footage. Evidently, John, flattered by the praise, crashed into the guardrail due to his negligence. Tim and I exchanged looks and laughed bitterly at the ridiculous cause of the accident. They said they would handle the affair partner themselves and just ask to go back home. That led to them calling me. Being exposed for deceiving the president's daughter and dating her would definitely get me fired. Please. I'll do as you say. Just don't tell her. Come on, we're married, right? Can't you show some consideration for me at the end? I've been a good husband supporting you. I deserve that much. I smirked at his attitude and responded. All right, I'll listen to everything you have to say, but I won't entertain any pathetic pleas for help. Got it? Ha, huh? as if I'd make such a pitiful, uncool plea. Okay, that's settled then. Thus, I divorced John, claimed a fixed amount including child support, and our marriage ended. But the real drama unfolded later. What do you mean? She found out about the affair. After some time post-divorce, John called me in distress. I realized I'd forgotten to block his number. As I pondered this, he continued to rant. It's the worst. The president insists on apologizing to you and is furious with me. You broke the promise not to tell her, 
So give back the money now. While listening to John, I wondered why I ever married him. Then, I decided to reveal a truth he hadn't anticipated. You know I'm a car enthusiast, right? And a president you mentioned. He runs an auto parts manufacturing company. Actually, I've been a client there. I requested them to fix my car you wrecked. Then, by chance, his daughter was there, your mistress, seeing the car, she screamed, and everything came to light, see, I didn't break any promise. Realizing this, John groaned. His mistress was working diligently as an apprentice mechanic at her father's company. It was natural for her to be shocked when a woman she didn't know brought in the car her boyfriend had damaged for repairs. When asked what happened, I simply stated the truth. My ex-husband crashed into a guardrail causing a solo accident, and since the car is under my name, I brought it in for repairs. The mistress pieced everything together, explained the situation to her father, and it probably reached his company. Her father was furious, questioning the upbringing that led to his daughter being involved with a married man. Now I lose everything. Kicked out of my home, broke, estranged by my dad, and left with my burdensome mom. And now I'm losing my job too. His complaints were his own doing. If you had lived decently, none of this would have happened. It's all due to your actions. Take care and don't contact me ever again. I firmly stated my farts and hung up. This time, I definitively blocked John's number, cutting off our relationship for good. Later, I received a call that my car was repaired, inadvertently learning about John's fate. Indeed, it seems he was fired from the company. The reason was that he embezzled the company's money. There was a suggestion that returning the money could have led to a demotion instead of dismissal, but with a substantial debt incurred to pay me, John didn't have that luxury. Thus, he left the company unceremoniously. Isabella has continued to be dependent on John. At their age, it's not feasible to force her to work, and without any money, she has no choice but to care for him at home. They are now living in a cramped studio apartment, costing around $200 a month. Of course, after the in-laws divorced, Tim proposed not dividing the assets and hence not demanding alimony, which Isabelle agreed to. However, this led to a life of extreme poverty. John saved money by eating simple foods like baked potatoes, but unable to resist, Isabella ordered expensive steak for delivery, leading to a dispute that required police intervention. Eventually, Isabella had to find work and is now doing part-time jobs at a convenience store several times a week. Despite her age, it's sad she has to work, but for Isabella, it's a case of reaping what she sowed, and no one sympathizes with her. On my end, I've continued with life as usual after divorcing John. I was already covering most of the living expenses, so Olivia and I have stayed in our home, with no major changes to our lifestyle. Ironically, Olivia's grades improved, possibly because she was free from John's constant nagging about her studies. Especially her art grades have been excellent, and she's even expressed a desire to pursue a career in the arts. As a parent, my role is to respect her choices. Even if it's a thorny path, as long as it's not leading her astray, I'm intent on letting her pursue her interests to her heart's content. Look, I won first place in the contest again. That's my girl. You've got real talent in art. Olivia visited Tim in his facility, maintaining their relationship through her updates. I divorced John, so he is no longer my fill, but this is how I continue to connect with Tim through Olivia. I am deeply grateful to Tim, who believed in me over John and Isabella. 
I hope he lives a long and healthy life. Life's gonna be tough from here on out. I never thought she'd be paralyzed from the waist down. That's what happens when she doesn't listen to her in-laws. I could hear the energetic voice of my mill coming from the landline speaker. One afternoon at my parents' house, holding the receiver in one hand, my mom looked at me with a puzzled expression, clearly not understanding what was being said to her. It seems someone had an accident, and for some reason, she's thrilled about it. The confused mom asked my mill what's going on. Well, Susan, what do you mean by it's serious? We looked at each other as my mill laughed over the phone. She had lost her husband early and told my husband and me that she had been living alone for a long time and felt lonely. Hence, she suggested we live together with her. Initially, she said she didn't need us to pay for rent or household chores. However, within two months, she flipped her stance, saying, that was just adult politeness. It's only natural to pay some kind of compensation, leading to repeated arguments. We couldn't fix our relationship after all. I was in a period of going back and forth between my parents' house to carry my belongings as I was moving out of my in-law's place. My mill, with her nasty personality, had been troubling me every day. Just like when she showered me with mean comments, she blurted out to my mom. That's why, deal, my deal. Your silly daughter caused a major accident because the brakes wouldn't work. It's weird, right? Shocked, I couldn't help but speak up towards the speaker. Deal, you mean me, right? I'm fine, though. What accident are you talking about? My name is Emily. I'm 35 years old and currently work as a salesperson for luxury accessories in a department store. After graduating from a college, I've been employed at an accessory shop for nearly 15 years. While considered a senior in the workforce, I find joy and fulfillment in keeping up with new trends and catering to customers' needs, working energetically daily. The age range at my workplace is broad, but given we sell women's accessories, the staff is predominantly female. Among them, I was one of the few who were still single. I wanted to get married and had been actively looking for a partner through friends' introductions, but had yet to find the right match by the time I turned 35. Thus, I took the initiative to seek out a marriage counseling service. I earnestly listened to the counselor, sharing my values and lifestyle in detail. Considering whether there was a match, I ended up meeting Harry, an engineer. He was a year older than me, had a good vibe, and the way he listened to me, slightly blushing, left a very good impression. After hitting it off, we went on several dates, gradually getting to know each other better. I sometimes slipped into my sales pitch talk, but as I spoke with him, that stiffness melted away. Over time, Harry would enthusiastically talk about his favorite novels, and I found myself engaging more openly, the complete opposite of how we started. We both agreed that we wouldn't find a better match than we did. Based on our deep trust in each other, we decided to get married. We were looking for a new home close to my husband's family home. His father had passed away early but left behind a significant inheritance, and my mill, Susan, continued to live there alone. Harry had moved out after getting a job and only returned occasionally. It seemed she had been feeling anxious for a long time, and one day, she suggested we move in with her. Being alone all the time just makes the loneliness accumulate. I'm at an age where I have to worry about illness and injuries, right? Instead of looking for a new place, you don't need to pay rent. So if you're okay with it, why not live here together? 
it would mean we could spend more time together. Of course, I wouldn't get in the way of a newlywed couple. Could you consider it, thinking of it as a way to ease my worries? My impression of my mill from our visit was that she was gentle and modest, saying, we'll keep our living areas separate, and since I'm not working, I'll take care of the household drawers and cleaning. The loneliness of her living alone was palpable, and understandably, neither my husband nor I could dismiss her outright. Moreover, we were thinking about starting infertility treatments because we wanted children in the future. These treatments would require a long time and significant medical expenses. We had planned to cut back on our living expenses for the cost, but living with my in-laws would not only save money but also allow us to save more. This would enable us to approach the treatment more systematically. Thus, we started to think quite positively about living together. Honestly, it's a wish come true. Rather than living by ourselves in the neighborhood before moving in together, why not start living together now? It'll save us from changing our living style multiple times and wasting money on moving expenses. That's right. I don't want to see your mother looking so lonely. Moving into my in-law's house was nerve-wracking due to the mill and deal relationship. However, it seemed like the best solution both financially for us and mentally for my mill. After much discussion, we decided to move in with my mill. Upon hearing our decision, she said, Thank you, really thank you. Being with family is the greatest happiness. And she cried with joy. We moved our belongings in and smoothly started our new life. However, just a few months later, my mole's attitude had completely changed. One day, she suddenly said to me with a stern face, You always come home late. What's going on? You say it's work, but is it really? Retail jobs should end once the customers leave. It doesn't make sense that you're not coming home until this late after the department store closes. Where exactly are you working? I was taken aback and lost for words. And when are you planning to quit? She continued. I held a responsible position. My job wasn't limited to just sales. There were meetings at the department store in other locations, and it wasn't unusual to work overtime during busy periods. My husband knew it, and he supported me without saying anything when I came home later than him. I was taken aback by the suggestion that I should quit my job and stay at home. First of all, if you've married into this family, you should devote yourself to the household. How long do you plan to work? This would have been unthinkable in my time. If I had known you were like this, I would not have agreed to have you as my deal. Susan, I value my job as well and Harry and I have decided to support each other and live our lives together. Continuing with our jobs is a choice my husband and I have made. I managed to say this in response, though trembling. However, my mill became even more stern and scoffed at my words. A woman working just disrupts the household. You have a responsibility to keep the house in order while my son is away. You should understand that better. She wouldn't listen to me and kept insisting I quit my job. As her delusions escalated, she started making baseless accusations like, the reason you're not coming home must be because you're hiding something. So I hurriedly told my husband to mediate. Of course, I had nothing to hide. My husband was shocked by the sudden change in his mother, but stepped into reason with her. Although she looked unsatisfied, it seemed she eventually resigned herself to just complaining about me. However, the snide remarks towards me didn't stop. Far from improving, she suddenly started saying things like, don't you think it's about time you started paying rent? 
but you said at the beginning that we didn't need to pay rent, just living here would be enough. Don't you understand that was just a figure of speech adults use, day such a thing as manners, even among family members, living here for free without feeling any shame. Considering you want to keep your job so much, I thought you were getting paid with great pride, but it seems it's not much after all. My mill was now going against the initial agreement, suggesting we pay rent, which was completely different from what was promised. Despite the inheritance, my husband and I were covering most of the everyday expenses. It didn't seem like she had any financial troubles. Yet, claiming the initial conditions were just out of consideration put us in a difficult position. Faced with such disrespectful comments, I firmly responded to my mill. We came here under the condition that no rent was needed. But if that's not the case, my husband and I are prepared to leave. Immediately, she turned red-faced, shouting about ingratitude and complaining. Not even talking about rent, you don't even pay a gratitude fee. It seemed she wanted to argue that even if not rent, we should at least pay something as a gesture of gratitude. Being asked to pay a gratitude fee instead of rent didn't change the financial burden on us. Moreover, the amount she proposed was significantly higher than the rent for apartments in the nearby area. When I brought this up with my husband, we decided to give her a certain amount monthly. She must want some pocket money. Mom has been living alone and managing on her own for so long. If a little whimsy can be solved with money, it should be considered cheap. It seemed my husband was also frustrated dealing with his mother. Though we didn't agree to the demanded amount, settling on a smaller sum as pocket money temporarily stopped her tirades. Though she was still visibly unsatisfied, this solution seemed to settle one problem. Just when I thought that was over, another incident occurred. Linda, my husband's sister, my sill, has returned. My sill had moved out after getting married, but due to certain reasons, she had divorced. One day, suddenly arriving with a large suitcase, she declared, I'll be living here from today. It's also sudden, but my husband was cheating. So I slapped the divorce papers on him and left. Don't worry, I've been a housewife for a long time, so I won't be any trouble. However, she insisted on having a luxurious dinner, suggesting, since it's a special occasion, why not get some beef steak? My mill seemed thrilled to have her daughter back and was clearly on her side. Given that my sister-in-law's ex-husband was a wealthy executive and she flaunted flashy brand name items, I was worried about her future spending habits. We had met her only a few times during the engagement and wedding. She is 40 years old, four years older than me. Due to the slight age difference, we didn't quite hit it off. Moreover, upon learning about my job, she made outrageous requests like, you must have an employee discount, right? Why don't you get me something for free since we're family? My husband and I were stunned. After we curtly refused, she glared at me irritably and lost interest, saying, oh, I see. Such an inconsiderate sell. Well, considering your age, I guess Harry was desperate. With such remarks, my sister-in-law's presence made me increasingly feel at my limit. My mill would complain of back pain and being overworked, leaving all the household drawers to me. Even though my cell, currently unemployed, could have shared the tasks, she refused, claiming, I'm tired from the divorce drama, and I didn't come back to be put to work. Harry tried to help, but being an engineer, he was often exhausted after a day's work. Eventually, I reached my breaking point. Tears would suddenly stream down my face, 
sleepless nights became common, and starting infertility treatment became the least of my worries. The stress led me to consider counseling, as maintaining everyday life became a struggle. Seeing my distressed state, my husband suggested, let's move out as soon as we can. It's not right for you to go through this, and we can't keep putting up with my mom and sister. I'm sorry, I should have prioritized you over them. But we don't have the money for that. We can't be worrying about costs right now. The most important thing is your health. He started looking for a new place immediately. However, it was precisely the season for graduations and new school terms, making affordable housing scarce and quickly taken. It seemed like moving out of my in-law's house would take some time. Meanwhile, my relationship with my sil didn't improve and only seemed to worsen. As a salesperson, I used somewhat expensive cosmetics and accessories to maintain a professional appearance. My sil, being unemployed and short on funds, she seemed envious of my belongings. I started noticing items missing or moved. And when confronted, she would nonchalantly confess. What's the big deal? I like this brand too. It should be okay to borrow a little. These are my personal belongings. Please don't use them without asking. Don't make such a fuss over using a lipstick or borrowing a necklace for a day. We're family, so don't get so worked up. Mom, tell your deal she's being too possessive. Despite multiple warnings, she would bring my mill into the argument, both ganging up on me with petty complaints. My mill would sigh in exasperation and scold me, try to be more accommodating. Just because she's your soul doesn't mean you have to make such a fuss. No improvement was in sight. I put my personal belongings in a locked box so they wouldn't be touched, but eventually she broke the key with a tool. Standing over the shattered remains of the small key, my patience finally snapped. No matter how many times I've pointed it out, nothing changes, and now even my keys are broken. I've had enough. If living together means not respecting each other's belongings, then we can't continue living together. I'm moving out. I declared this to the two of them and started hastily packing my belongings into a large bag. My mill, furious, followed me around yelling, think it over, you can't endure even that much. But realizing I was not listening, she started making a phone call somewhere. The call was to my family home, unbelievably. Whether my mom picked up the phone or not, I could hear her lodging a complaint. What kind of upbringing have you given your daughter? I couldn't catch how my mom responded, but soon after, I got a call. Was that call just now from your mill, Harry's mom? She said something really odd. Emily, are you okay? Are things not going well with your mill? My mom seemed to get more worried about what my mill said, but she was furious when I explained the reason. She told me, come back home immediately. My husband, upon hearing about the situation later, also suggested, once we find a new place, I'll come to pick you up. Encouraged by this, I began to prepare in earnest and left my in-law's house the next day. Needless to say, none of them came to see me off or tried to stop me. I planned to collect my belongings from my in-law's house while commuting between my parents' home, my in-laws, and work. A few weeks later, as I was cleaning at my parents' house in the morning before my afternoon shift, the home phone rang. My mom checked and, with a puzzled look, picked up the receiver, saying, It's your mill. Watching my mom on the phone, she soon made a strange face and signaled to me. Apparently, my mill was saying something odd on the phone. When she put it on speaker, a familiar loud voice, 
sounding quite pleased with herself, burst through. Life's going to be tough from now on, huh? Who would have thought she'd end up like that? Well, who exactly is having a tough time? What exactly are you talking about? So, deal, my deal. What goes around comes around. Your foolish daughter caused a major accident because the brakes failed. We looked at each other, bewildered. I hadn't caused any accident. In fact, I hadn't even stepped out of my parents' house since this morning. My mill, even more delighted, kept talking. And to think she caused a major accident right before going to work. It's her own fault for not quitting. It's really strange, isn't it? There were too many questionable points, and none of it made sense. I interrupted her tirade, addressing the speaker. Deal, you mean me, right? I'm fine, though. What accident are you talking about? What? No way. What do you mean? My mill was clearly flustered. It was a bizarre claim for a prank call. I pressed for meaning, but she was just panicking. Why are you all right? If it's not your accident, then whose is it? While we were going back and forth, my husband, Harry, appeared at my parents' house, visibly agitated. He rushed over and grabbed my shoulders, checking if I was okay. Then, he showed a relieved smile. Emily, I'm so glad you're safe. What's going on? But when your mom and you, what happened? When I asked, Harry suddenly said, my sister was in an accident. Your sister? I'm just glad Emily wasn't involved. We're heading to the hospital now. Can you come with us? Hearing that from my husband, I nodded without hesitation. We took the afternoon off work and rushed to the hospital. When we arrived at the hospital, we were told that my Syl was still undergoing treatment, but her life was not in danger and she was fully conscious. My Mill, who was panicking, had also arrived, and we all were immediately relieved by this news. Then, we went back and forth between the hospital and the in-law's house, preparing what was necessary for Linda's hospital stay until her treatment was completed. When Linda was moved to her hospital room, she was exhausted, lying in bed in a pitiful state. She was able to have a conversation, so my husband went over to her and started to listen to her story. This morning, when I was getting in the car to go to work, the brakes stopped working on the way and I crashed into a utility pole. I heard no one else was involved, but is that really true? Yes. It was on a street with no pedestrian traffic, so no one else was caught up in it, but your back is. We had already heard about the after effects of the injuries from the accident she caused herself. Thanks to quick rescue efforts, Linda managed to survive but had severely injured her back. As a result, she's now paralyzed from the waist down. She can't move her legs or walk and living on her own is out of the question. And it seems almost certain that this paralysis will remain as a lasting after effect. As the doctors explained this to Linda, she said, I can't believe it, how can this happen? And I'll sue the maintenance company, trying to lash out in tears. But since she could only move her upper body, my husband was easily able to restrain her. Indeed, the brake failure seems like it could only be due to poor maintenance. I suddenly noticed that Susan, my mill in the corner of the room, had turned pale. Susan, are you okay? Despite the terrible situation, I couldn't harbor any resentment. She looked like she might faint, so I was worried. But Susan didn't say anything even when I spoke to her. Then, my husband asked, do you have any idea about this? His voice was so cold and stern that it surprised me. 
I'm asking if you know anything about the car accident. Susan, blue-faced and shaking, said, no, and she shook her head. No matter how many times he asked, the answer was the same. No, I don't know, she denied, but a bad feeling was growing inside me. My husband excused himself to Linda and checked her smartphone. All the family cars are equipped with dash cams, and footage from several weeks can be reviewed through a dedicated app. When he pulled up the data from Linda's car and pressed the play button, we were about to witness something shocking. Isn't this Susan? The lights in the garage turn on, and my mill, Susan, appears. I can tell Susan is scrutinizing the inside of the car from across the hood. She seems to be thinking about something, carrying items to the front of my sill Linda's car and squatting repeatedly. Since the dash cam records video and audio, I can hear sounds of something being dragged and her muttering to herself. It's tricky, huh? What? It's this heavy. Maybe this way. I'm sure this is the right line. From the occasional words heard, it's clear she's searching for something by crawling under the car. Suddenly, there's a loud snap. She's cutting something under the car. Both Linda and I immediately understand what she's doing and we can feel the blood draining from our faces. Confronted with the footage, Susan starts to tremble all over. From her voice in the video, terrifying words can be heard. This will send that deal straight to hell. I finally understood her attitude when she called the family home. It seems my mill, Susan, was actually hoping I would get into an accident. But it was my sill, Linda, who ended up in the accident. She had mistaken my car for Linda's, but it became clear she had tampered with it herself. Unbelievable. Mom, what were you planning to do if I had died? Linda, furious, confronted Susan, who blurted out in panic. I couldn't tell the cars apart. There was a reason Susan mixed up the cars. As it turns out, Linda and I coincidentally had the same model and color of car. It is a standard black compact. The mix-up came to light the day she moved back in, and we were both quite shocked. Since my parents' home had no parking space, my car was always left at my in-laws. I was planning to leave the house completely, so I left the car when I wasn't using it. It was impossible for us, who regularly used our cars, to mistake them. We each had our designated parking spots in the garage. However, Linda always acted superior to me, choosing whichever spot was more convenient for her at the moment. Despite numerous warnings, she never changed, making it understandable that Susan was confused. I used my car yesterday and upon returning, found Linda's car in my spot. Not wanting to engage, I parked in her spot and went straight to my parents' house. But Susan had no idea about these circumstances. Not being familiar with cars, she unknowingly tampered with it. Linda is sobbing bitterly, blaming her mother, you're the one at fault for not checking properly. Susan, perhaps panicked, starts to lash out nonsensically. It's your fault for not parking in the right spot. What are you going to do now that you're in this condition? What am I going to do? It's my fault. It's not an accident. It's an incident you caused, Mom. Their shouts fill the hospital, creating a chaotic scene. My husband took me out of the room for a moment. And, given that it was clear Susan had intentionally tampered with a car, called the police. Due to the recentness of the incident, the police arrived quickly to handle the situation. With the dash cam footage and the audio recorded from the moment we entered the hospital room submitted, Susan was taken to the police. Amidst the turmoil and her turning pale, 
Susan was led away, and Linda, with her eyes swollen from crying, tentatively addressed my husband and me. We're family, not strangers. You'll take care of mom in her absence, right? She subtly inquired about future care, but my husband immediately responded with a firm no. My husband, an engineer who works with cars, glared at Linda, clearly dissatisfied. The cause of the accident isn't solely on mom. A warning light should have come on if the brake hose was cut. Plus, if the brake fluid were drained, you'd realize something was off as soon as you pressed the pedal. You should have stopped the car then, instead of forcefully driving it until you got seriously injured. From my point of view, you're the one full of problems. After cutting her off sharply, he then started showing us a video on his smartphone. It was footage from Linda's dash cam, but the time was different from before. The timestamp showed this morning. It was just as Linda was about to leave for work. Of course, Linda herself was in the footage. She was clearly struggling with a heavy load, trying to pack it into her car. The load looked like a small safe. It looked familiar to me, and I raised my voice. Isn't that the safe for your watch? When I exclaimed in surprise, my husband nodded with a stern face. For some reason, Linda was trying to move the expensive watch safe that my husband had been keeping safe. Acting suspiciously and in a hurry. She tried to drive out of the garage after loading the safe into the car without properly checking her surroundings or even fastening her seatbelt. This scene played out right before my eyes, and she looked as pale as my mill had earlier. When my husband demanded an explanation in no uncertain terms, Linda hesitantly started confessing to something outrageous. Initially, she had explained that she was just taking the car out for work, but it turned out she had planned to take the safe with the watch and sell everything. It seems she thought that even though she didn't have the key to the safe, breaking it would suffice. Right after starting the car, she noticed something off with the brakes, but in her rush to get away from the house quickly, she pressed the accelerator, which seems to have led to the accident. Linda cried and tried to explain, but my husband looked down on her disdainfully. I needed the money right away to pay back my ex-husband. I was just going to borrow a little bit. Linda had returned home after her divorce, but she had lied then as well. She said she divorced her husband and moved back to her parents' house because he cheated on her, but the truth was the exact opposite. The one who cheated was actually Linda herself. She was sued for damages, lost all her savings, and couldn't afford to live on her own. So she had no choice but to flee back to her parents' house. She didn't want to share the embarrassing story of owing alimony, so to save face, she made her ex-husband out to be the bad guy. Since she's not working after moving back, She's losing sight of how to pay off the unpaid alimony. So, she was getting by selling off expensive items from the house without permission. But there's a limit to everything. Eventually, she set her sights on Harry's luxury watch, leading to this debacle. Thinking about the alimony stresses me out, but I felt better while bossing around Emily with mom. That's why I did such a horrible thing. I'm going to change, I promise. Please, don't give up on me. She started saying this in a soft voice as if she was despairing about her future. But when she saw the unimpressed look in my husband's eyes and mine, she seemed to realize she was at a disadvantage. Suddenly, her demeanor changed, and she started shouting, Don't run away. Support and take care of me. As if her earlier proclamation of change was forgotten. Given her past behavior, such demands were bound to fall on deaf ears. There's still alimony left to pay. I took that accident for you. 
Ungrateful wretch, ruining someone's life. You guys should pay the money instead. My husband and I listened in silence. But as she grew tired, her panting became more and more incoherent. She made such a commotion that several nurses rushed in, prompting my husband and me to leave the room. We nodded to each other, agreeing, never come back. Later, the police conducted inquiries, asking if anyone besides my husband was knowledgeable about cars. What my mill did was nothing short of criminal, and her arrest was inevitable. However, it was still unclear how someone who neither drove nor had any knowledge about cars could come up with the idea to cut the brake hose, let alone how she prepared the tools for it. But neither my husband nor I could think of anyone who fit the bill. A few days later, the investigation revealed a surprising truth. It turned out my mill had been paying a significant amount of money to a young man she met before we got married. The man was a notorious figure who targeted older women, pretending to date them to swindle money. My mill, cutting into her inheritance and living expenses from my fill, poured money into dates with this man. As her savings dwindled and life became harder, she proposed moving in with us, hoping to be supported. Unsatisfied with just that, she attempted to collect money under the guise of rent or gratuity. However, after we repeatedly refused to pay, claiming it was not part of our agreement, she desperately turned to the man for advice. That's when he suggested something dreadful. If your deal dies, your son, being her husband, would get the insurance money. With that, we could live it up in fancy hotels and have fun every day. My mill had long been under the young man's influence and, egged on by him, bought the specified tools and carried out his plan. However, the car tampered with was actually the sister-in-law's, leading to this tragedy. The identity of the young man was also uncovered. Though interrogated, he denied everything, saying, We talked. But it was all jokes, and I didn't tell her what to buy or give any instructions. He also repeated that while he did go on date-like outings with my mill, there was no romantic relationship, she was merely a source of money for him. I wasn't serious, so I wouldn't incite criminal behavior, he claimed. However, the police, suspecting otherwise, discovered evidence that a plan to steal my insurance money from my husband was seriously contemplated. Additionally, the man's other crimes, including extortion against other women, were uncovered. Thus, both he and my mill were arrested. After the trial, the mill received a prison sentence. Lindy apparently contacted her ex-husband to get him to take care of her, but he had already started a new life and hated her, so the conversation ended with him telling her to pay alimony quickly. Linda, who has a rough and selfish personality, started using helpers from welfare services. No matter how much she was warned, she was constantly turned away from private services because she treated the helpers in charge as if they were little servants. And finally, she had no time to choose people. Ultimately, she was assigned a calm helper who would not tolerate her unreasonable demands. Despite her frequent requests for someone warm, with human kindness, no one willing to replace the efficient but cold helper appeared. The assignment became permanent. My life also so changes. This incident had greatly worried my parents, so I requested a transfer to a location closer to my home. The request was approved, and I happily started working near my family. Feeling uncomfortable living near his in-law's town, my husband successfully found a new job and we decided to move closer to my parents' home. It's a fresh start for us in a new place but he's always considerate, 
saying he wants to make up for the trouble caused and always tries his best. The watch that was stolen by Linda was held by the police for the investigation but was eventually returned to him. Due to the impact of the accident, the safe it was stored in was damaged. Some of the watches inside were broken, but my husband said, let's make these a keepsake for the whole family, as he decided to cut ties with his family. Both of us have started to get used to the new environment. Now, we are in the process of choosing a hospital to start the fertility treatments we had originally planned for. Don't you dare come back here. You failure. For over 20 years, I thought I had been devoted to John. Yet, this is how John really felt about me. I wasn't leeching off him. I was just devoted to him. But now, I'm at a loss for words. As I felt all strength leave my body, John continued. Ryan's a working adult now, so you have no reason to depend on me, right? But... Quiet, I don't want to hear your excuses. John raised his voice. Oh no, it's hopeless. My feelings didn't reach him. At that moment, I felt something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that bound our hearts, breaking. Simultaneously, my feelings for John began to fade. We were married just a moment ago, but now I feel as if he were a stranger to me. John was just using me from the start. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't blatantly cheat and try to kick me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. No, I must utterly defeat him. With my mind made up, I looked up and stared straight at John. My name is Karen Johnson. I'm a 50-year-old housewife, married to John for 25 years. Our son, Ryan, was born a few years into our marriage and has just graduated college and started working. With parenting duties winding down, I was looking forward to pursuing my interests. That's what I'm thinking now. But there's just one problem. My relationship with John. John is far from a good husband or father. In fact, it's hard to find anything good about him. He cheats, and he doesn't even provide a proper salary. Please, can you at least contribute to the household expenses? Huh? Don't get cheeky with me when you're living off my earnings. John always retorts like this. Maybe it really is hopeless. Maybe divorce is the only option. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. But I can't just suggest divorce easily. My Phil, Bob, who is unwell and hospitalized, asked me to look after John. I owe it to Bob to endure as long as I can. His words can't be ignored. But my desire to divorce is strong. Torn between these conflicting feelings, I find myself reminiscing about the happier times before our marriage. The turning point that led to such happiness before my marriage was actually due to a misfortune that struck my father. Our family owned a small diner. My father was in charge of cooking and my mother handled the serving. Needless to say, the food was delicious. However, my dad was incredibly bad at business. He started the diner with a desire to feed customers delicious food to their heart's content. I think that's a noble cause. 
but he ran a diner solely on that sentiment, hardly considering the profitability. It didn't matter to him if the profits were low, as long as the customers were satisfied with tasty food. Naturally, such a business, of course, that would not be profitable. As a result, our family's finances were always tight. Even as a child, I took pride in seeing customers leave satisfied. So I never interfered with my father's business approach. However, when I was in college, a crisis hit. The company supplying ingredients to my dad's diner went bankrupt due to the recession. We've already paid this month's dues. If this continues, we might have to close our diner. We were already barely managing as it was, and there was no way we could spare extra funds. Seeing my parents so downcast made me anxious too. But as a college student, there was little I could do, and I doubted the bankrupt company could refund us. The only option seemed to be closing the diner. That's when a regular customer, a man, said something unexpected. Closing the diner. Such a shame for such delicious food. But with the supplier's bankruptcy, we'll end up in debt. Then let me help you personally to get back on your feet. This regular, who really did lend my father a substantial amount. I'm glad to help. I'll certainly pay you back. Don't worry about the money. Just keep making delicious meals. He said, leaving the diner quickly after. Later, my father started doing business with another food wholesaler. It seems that it was a major food wholesaler there, and the wholesale price of foodstuffs was lower than before. Luckily, our family diner was saved from bankruptcy. About a year later, my father and I went to repay the man. Then, while the man and my father were talking, a young man approached me as I was waiting. I hear you borrowed money from my dad. When I talked to him, he was the son of the man who lent us the money. His name is John, and he works for a man's company. You're pretty. How about going out with me? Me, with you? Why not? Think of it as a way to say thanks for the loan. It was true we were helped by the loan. And my dad had properly thanked him. I thought we owed no more than that. But then John whispered to me. Ungrateful diner's daughter. I could spread that around, you know. That's... I couldn't retort. Even if he did spread rumors, it wouldn't affect me much. But it could trouble my father. And what would the diner's customers think? With these thoughts, I couldn't refuse John's invitation. Reluctantly, I agreed to go out with him. With that in mind, I went out with John. To my surprise, I actually enjoyed it more than expected. John was fun to talk to and knew many exciting places to go. He chose the places we went to with great taste. And I started to think maybe he wasn't such a bad guy after all. That's where my luck ran out. I was quickly wrapped around John's finger. It's fun being with you, Karen. I'm having fun too. I never thought I'd consider marriage until I met someone sincere and good like you. His simple words swept me off my feet, and I began a relationship with John, considering marriage. John continued to manipulate me in various ways. Eventually, 
a few years later, I found myself married to him. Of course, I had no idea at the beginning of our marriage that it was all a trap. John seemed genuinely kind, and I felt loved by him. But it was all a lie. As soon as we got married, he showed his true colors. Here's my salary for the month. Make it work. I opened the envelope John gave me. Inside was a pay stub. The salary itself was deposited directly into the bank, so just having the pay stubs wasn't suspicious. However, the one thing that struck me as odd was that all the pay stubs were handwritten. Today, handwritten stubs are almost unheard of. But I got married 25 years ago. A time when computers were just beginning to become widespread and handwritten pay stubs didn't seem out of place. It's over $1,000. That's normal, right? I reassured myself. I managed with that small amount of money as best as I could. Over time, I started noticing something odd about John's routine. John leaves the house at a certain time every morning but returns home at different times. It seemed to change from day to day. I'm busy with various jobs as my dad's successor. Then, at least call before coming home. Stop nagging. All right, I'll call. He'd shout. His attitude only heightened my suspicions. Maybe he was out playing around or even worse, having an affair. But his loud voice scared me from confronting him. Ultimately, even though I had doubts about John's behavior, I couldn't bring myself to say anything. Eventually, our son Ryan was born. I thought maybe things would change with a child. But John remained the same. Looking back, I think that's when I first started considering divorce. Then when Ryan was in middle school, I received a call from my mom while I was out shopping for dinner. What? Dad's in the hospital. My father had been admitted to the hospital. I rushed there immediately. Your mom's just exaggerating. My father laughed heartily. I was relieved. I suddenly remembered something that made my heart skip a beat. Oh no, I forgot to contact John. It was too late. My cell phone was flooded with missed calls from John. Panicked, I called John back, only to be greeted by his irritable voice. Where the heck are you? Get home and make my dinner. I'm sorry, my dad. What, your dad? John asked sharply. I answered in a small voice. Yes, he was suddenly hospitalized. What does your dad have to do with it? You're my wife, remember? John's shout made me flinch and close my eyes. I was terrified of his yelling, but I knew I had to stand up for myself. I mustered my courage and responded, Isn't it natural to worry about my dad? I should be allowed that much, right? Shut up! Don't talk back to me! No, I will say this. You would rush to Bob's side too, wouldn't you? I asked. John suddenly fell silent. I thought putting himself in my shoes would make him understand. But his response was beyond my wildest expectations. Huh, I'd ignore my dad even if he were hospitalized. After all, I don't need him. I was speechless. It had to be a lie. 
but I couldn't deny it. After much hesitation, I told John, I'm not like you. Sorry, but you'll need to eat out tonight. That was all I could muster. I hung up the phone, feeling numb. Since that incident, I truly lost all trust in John. It was then that I realized the happy times before our marriage were all an illusion. I, I see. John wanted a housekeeper, not a wife. I said to myself, feeling sad, but I couldn't just wallow in sadness. That's right. If I'm considering divorce, I need to start preparing. I began making plans for a divorce. Then, a few years later, Bob was hospitalized and his condition was quite serious. He might not be able to leave the hospital. I relayed the doctor's words to John. But John was unfazed. So, it's going to cost money, huh? Is money all you're worried about? Don't you understand? I understand. I'll talk to my brother. John contacted his brother, George, who was married but childless, to see if he could help with the hospital expenses. Can't you pay for it? We have Ryan and Karen here, and it's tough for us. John said, as if it were someone else's problem. It reminded me of the time my father was hospitalized. John clearly didn't care about Bob. I couldn't take it anymore. Enough, I'll figure something out and pay for Bob's hospital bills. Don't forget what you just said. John yelled. I nodded firmly. In the end, my statement led to us bearing the cost of Bob's hospital stay. Moreover, Bobbleness caused him to step down from his position as president. And John took over. Regardless, John seemed displeased that I had stepped in. Since then, he has barely come home. This was evident even when we discussed Ryan's future. John ignored my calls and didn't come home. Dad's not coming home again today, huh? I'm sorry, Ryan. I didn't mean to cause trouble. It's fine. I don't care about Dad. I want to go to a university in New York. That's right. Don't worry about the tuition. I'll manage it somehow. Soon. Ryan's admission to a New York University was settled. As expected, John didn't even see him off. Once Ryan moved to New York, the house felt empty. By then, John was only coming home about once a week. Could you transfer a bit more for Bob's hospital bills? Huh? I've already transferred over half my salary. It should be enough since you're the only one here. John's contribution was just a small amount of money. Clearly, only a fraction of his salary. His claim of transferring over half was undoubtedly a lie. I knew this, but I didn't have the energy to argue. Years passed, and I received news of Ryan getting a job. Now that Ryan has a job, it might be time to talk about divorce. I had prepared for this over the years. The only thing left was timing. When and where should I bring it up to avoid conflict? These farts consumed my mind. It's not really about avoiding conflict, is it? I laughed bitterly at myself. One day, after visiting Bob in the hospital, after chatting with Bob and returning home as usual, 
I was startled when I was about to open the front door. I didn't know why, but the front door was unlocked. Was it a burglar? I peeked inside cautiously. Then, I heard the TV and John's laughter from the living room. Relieved that John was home, I entered the living room. John was laughing loudly while watching TV. You're home. Yeah, just thought I'd tidy up the house a bit. Tidy up. I looked around as John suggested. Upon closer inspection, some items in the room were missing. Huh? It looks like some things are missing. Yeah, I threw them away. Your stuff. Threw away. My stuff. Shocked, I rushed to my room. It was empty. My computer, TV, even my favorite mug, are all gone. Even the bed. Everything was missing. What is this? I threw them out because they're no longer needed. Not needed. What am I supposed to do now? As I raised my voice, John frowned, looked away, and sighed. How should I put it? I'm tired of supporting you. What is that supposed to mean? I am your wife. I retorted, and John got irritated. He suddenly raised his voice. Do I have to spell it out? Don't leech off me anymore, you failure. For over 20 years, I thought I had been devoted to John. But this is how he really felt about me. I wasn't leeching off him. I was just devoted to him. Words failed. Me as my strength drained away, and John continued. Ryan's a working adult now, so you have no reason to depend on me, right? But... Shut up! I don't want to hear your excuses! John shouted. Oh no, it's hopeless. My feelings didn't reach him. At that moment, I felt something snap inside me. It was the sound of the thread of love that bound our hearts, breaking. At the same time, my feelings for John began to fade. We were married just a moment ago, but now he feels like a stranger. John was just using me from the start. He never loved me. Otherwise, he wouldn't blatantly cheat and try to kick me out. I don't care what happens to such a man. No, I must utterly defeat him. With my mind made up, I looked up and stared straight at John. What? Got something to say? Nothing. If you want me to leave, I'll do just that. I slammed the living room door with force and headed to my room. But there was nothing of mine left. Not even a single piece of clothing. Don't bother looking. It's all gone. I had the junk collectors take it away. Which company did you use for this? The flyer's right here. That's the one. I picked up the flyer of the disposal company that was on the floor while dialing the number, I told John, You're going to regret this. After saying that, I immediately left the house. The call connected shortly. Once I explained the situation, they readily understood. It seems they had felt something off about John's actions and had kept everything they collected intact. I'll be right over. Thank you so much. I said, expressing my gratitude before hanging up. Then I went to the disposal company. After thanking them, 
I had them move my belongings into a storage unit I had just rented. Relieved that my belongings were safe. You won't get away with this so easily. Grinding my teeth, I called Ryan and briefly explained the situation before saying, So, I've decided to move out, considering a divorce. That's what you should expect, okay? Ah, uh, okay, by then. Ryan quickly ended the call. He seemed scared of me. Was I really that angry? I pondered as I put my phone back into my bag and headed to a nearby business hotel. In fact, I had already decided where to move. The reason was simple. I had been planning to talk to John about divorce soon. My plan was to divorce and start a new life there. Well, it's just happening a bit sooner than planned. Honestly, I wasn't in trouble. It was just an advancement of my plans by a mere two weeks. Two weeks in a hotel. What a waste. I couldn't help feeling it was wasteful. A typical housewife's habit. Maybe I should bill him for the hotel too. Well, brace yourself, John. I muttered to myself and started working on my post-divorce plans. After about 10 days living in the business hotel, John called me during lunch. As soon as I answered, he raised his voice. You, you stole my money. Huh, what are you talking about? Don't play dumb. It's about my dad's hospital bills. The hospital just called asking for payment. Bob, that is what it is. I fought, sighing in response. Ah, that. Just pay it yourself. I'm not involved anymore since you kicked me out. I've been transferring living expenses to you. You're supposed to pay for that. Sure, but isn't the bank book for that account with you now? I replied calmly, knowing well that there was no money in that account. I couldn't help but grin. I have the bank book, but there's no money in it. That's why I'm saying you stole it. I didn't steal anything. Don't lie. Who else could use it? He never thought the amount he transferred was too little, did he? I replied, exasperated. The money was always too little from the start. If there's no money for the hospital bills, why don't you use your allowance? My, my allowance. John started to panic, clearly thinking I was unaware. Since the beginning of our marriage, John had been giving me handwritten salary slips to hide the fact that he was skimming off a portion of his salary. In other words, the money he skimmed became his allowance. I asked Bob once, how much is John's salary, you know? So, that's, ah. Uh. He seemed puzzled, but he told me, so I knew you were skimming money. When I told him this, John fell silent. A long silence followed. So long I wondered if the call had dropped. Then suddenly, John raised his voice. What's wrong with me using the money I earned? It's your fault for using up all the money I gave you. Okay, okay. And then? I want a divorce. I'll demand alimony. You need to pay back the money you used. John's words made me grin inwardly. I had him right where I wanted him. He couldn't back out now. I replied with a smile. Oh, thank you. I wanted a divorce too. 
Come over to my place for the divorce discussions. What? No. But, I mean... You want a divorce, right? I've prepared evidence of your infidelity, and I'm waiting. Though I couldn't see him, I could tell John was taken aback. By his faltering voice. Evidence of infidelity. What are you talking about? Don't play dumb. I have photographic evidence. Photographic evidence. I could imagine John's flustered expression. Holding back laughter, I continued. Well, I'll give you the address, and let's meet next Sunday to discuss it in detail. After giving him a certain address unilaterally, I quickly hung up. I've successfully pushed for a divorce. Now, if only I can make him apologize. It was going to be tough, but I was ready. On the agreed Sunday, I arrived at the meeting place before the scheduled time. He should be arriving soon. Looking around, I spotted John in the corner of my eye. Over here. I waved and called out. John looked up, startled. What? This place? Yes, I gave you the address, remember? But, this place? Whose mansion is this? John looked behind me. Where a mansion worth about one million dollars stood. It was much larger than a regular house complete with a garden, three stories, a basement, and even a home theater. A luxury car was parked in the attached garage. Pointing at the mansion, I smiled. This is my house. It's brand new and beautiful, isn't it? What, your house? Yes, I was planning to live here after the divorce so I had it built recently. Yes, the place I had summoned John to was my newly built house. Naturally, John, who had always thought of me as just a housewife, was utterly astonished. I pushed him from behind into the house and led him to the living room. Let's have our discussion. This is my lawyer. I introduced my lawyer, who was waiting inside. But John was too distracted to pay attention. He was looking around nervously. He seemed concerned about his surroundings, constantly looking around. Not even glancing at the evidence of his infidelity on the table or responding to me. It was hardly a conversation. Eventually, John asked in a low voice. How did you afford this house? Is that what's bothering you? I'm used, answering nonetheless. I just bought it normally. Liar! How can a housewife afford this? To buy a $1 million house, one would typically need an income of around $150,000 per year but I had that kind of income. So I calmly replied, I earned that much. Got a problem with that. No, but how? I was helping a friend with her company, and before I knew it, things ended up like this. Maybe. The story goes back a few years. When my father was hospitalized and we had a dispute, I decided to divorce. I started preparing for it, first by looking for a job. After the divorce, I needed a job to live. So I looked for a job that would allow me to live independently. But good jobs aren't easy to find. So I consulted my close friend, Susan. Why don't you help me with my work? Your work. What do you do? 
Land-based aquaculture. Land-based aquaculture is a method where pools are artificially created for farming fish. Though there are drawbacks, it's eco-friendly as it prevents ocean pollution. Susan's father started it, and now she is running it. So, I started working there. John asked tentatively. After I started helping, the business suddenly began to do well. My role was mainly negotiation and administrative work. Susan said I was a huge help, and I was promoted to an executive position. It was all coincidental, but luck is part of skill, I believe. Hearing my story, John slumped in defeat, but then suddenly looked up. Okay, let's forget the divorce. How about we start over? Despite his words, I replied with a cold gaze. What? Can you say that in your sleep? No, I'm serious. I really want to start over with you. John pleaded passionately. But I knew he was just blinded by my money. So I replied with raised eyebrows. I refuse to be with someone who cheats and someone who neglects their father, too. No, about my dad. I. Enough. You might not know, but I was the one paying for Bob's hospital bills. The money John gave me was really a pittance. After paying for groceries, utilities, and other miscellaneous expenses, there was never anything left. That's all he ever gave me. Let alone enough to cover Bob's hospital bills. Initially, I managed somehow. But after starting my job, I covered the bills with my salary. Despite that, you never listened to me, nor did you visit Bob. That's... Uh. I can't trust someone like that. As I raised my voice, John looked deflated. The lawyer then discussed the alimony with him. John couldn't say anything and just nodded until the end. Eventually, encouraged by the lawyer, John signed the divorce papers. The alimony was set at $30,000. Now that the divorce is finalized, you'll be paying for Bob's hospital bills from now on. I said as John nodded, seemingly unhappy, but not objecting. I felt relieved. In the end, I sent John away. Glad it was finally over. The only regret was that I couldn't get an apology from him. But I had one last move. With that, I was sure John would apologize. Thinking about it made me smile unintentionally. A few days later, on my way back from the office, someone called out from behind. Hey, Karen. I turned around to find John standing there. Don't be so familiar. We're divorced now. Shut up. What did you do? John looked at me, his face red with anger. I realized then. Ah. Uh, the talk must have happened at the company. Smiling, I deezed him. What do you think I did? Don't joke around. Tell me, how did you get me fired? John was stomping his feet in frustration. I couldn't help but smile at his amusing state. Isn't it your own doing, getting fired for having an affair with the office clerk? John's affair was with a clerk at his company, where he had acted recklessly, thinking he could do anything as the president. Right after the divorce was settled, I reported this to Bob. While he regretted the divorce, 
He was furious about John's behavior. I showed him the photographs of the affair, which infuriated him even more. Then he made an offer. I'm thinking of transferring all my shears in the company to you, Karen. To me, wouldn't it be better for George? No, I want you to have them. Use them to dethrone John from the presidency. That's what Bob had said. Bob's company was a corporation where shareholder resolutions are necessary to appoint executives. Although decisions can also be made by the board of directors. In smaller companies like Bob's, where he owned most of the shares, a single shareholder could make significant decisions. But in small companies, it's common for the president to own most of the shares. When I inherited all his shares, I had the power to make decisions alone. But it wasn't me who decided to fire John. I informed George about the affair and my new shareholder status. The rest was his decision. George was considerate. Why did he listen to you? It's not about listening to me. It's about what's best for the company. John collapsed on the spot and began to apologize. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. No. I'll be lost without a job. His predicament was none of my concern. It was all self-inflicted. I won't forgive you. Please, I'm begging you. It was all self-inflicted. I turned my back on him. Sorry, but there's nothing I can do. Why, if you have the shares? I sold them to George and his wife. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. At that moment, I heard John sobbing. But I walked away, pretending not to hear. John was eventually ousted from the company. Perhaps he could have stayed as an employee, but his arrogant behavior, starting from his entry through nepotism, made that impossible. I refuse to be an employee. He had said, once fired, he was out. Now he's reportedly working as a convenience store clerk a difficult-to-find job at his age. He's likely to spend his old age in regret, without money. As for me, post-divorce, I became more focused on my work. There's no talk of remarriage, but there are a few men among my colleagues. A new spring might come. While thinking this, I received a call from Ryan. I'm bringing my girlfriend over. Okay, I'm looking forward to it. I failed in marriage, but I hope Ryan doesn't. But I'm sure it'll be okay. Ryan is much more stable than I ever was. While my husband, Jake, was on a business trip, I was having lunch with my mother-in-law, Susan, when Jake himself called me. Something serious has happened. Actually, mom has collapsed. What? I looked up, shocked. Susan, who was sitting in front of me, also widened her eyes in surprise. So, the route back from my business trip goes past my mother's house. I'm going to head there and take care of mom. I looked at Susan again. Then, Susan put her index finger to her lips, signaling me to keep quiet about her being with me. Understanding her intention, I decided to go along with my husband's story. Is your mother all right? Should I come too? No, it's okay. Since it's come to this, I'll just say it. 
My mom doesn't like you. She thinks you're a wife who won't listen. So, there's no need for you to come. I see. Got it? With that, the call ended. By this time, I had already realized Jake was clearly lying. And he had something he couldn't tell me. As I clenched my fists and trembled, Susan then said, So, what shall we do now? My name is Megan. I'm 30 years old. I'm a working housewife in my second year of marriage. I work from home as a writer. I specifically write travel-related articles, leveraging my experience working at a travel agency during my single days. I met Jake through an introduction by a college friend, Kevin. Kevin had promised to introduce me to a colleague, which turned out to be Jake. Jake works for a small to mid-sized company. He's pretty ordinary except for his slightly above average looks. We dated without any issues for about two years. He proposed on my birthday, and I happily accepted. We visited my parents to get their blessing for our marriage. Next, we went to visit Jake's family. His parents were divorced, and his dad had moved abroad, leaving only his mom at the family home. I was initially nervous about meeting her, knowing that she was a self-made CEO of her own company. Nice to meet you. I'm Megan, and I'm in a relationship with Jake. Upon my greeting, Susan said, I've been looking forward to meeting you. Come in, come in. Susan said that with her youthful short hair and straightforward demeanor. Nervously, I sat next to Jake. Mom, I want to marry her. Well, if you two have decided, I won't oppose. Congratulations. Susan said that with a smile, which put me at ease. Then, the conversation turned to my job. What kind of work do you do, Megan? I'm a freelance writer. Mostly, I'm just at home on my computer. Susan's face clouded over instantly. A writer from home. Is that really okay? What do you mean? Well, isn't that kind of like a hobby? It must be unstable income-wise. That's not true. I consider it a legitimate job. However, Susan remains skeptical. But still, a steady job like being a full-time employee would be better, wouldn't it? I'm passionate about my current job. At that moment, Jake intervened. Let's just leave it at that, okay? The situation smoothed over, but Susan still frowned. While she didn't oppose our marriage, she never really understood my job. Nevertheless, our new home was about a two-hour drive from Susan's place. I figured we wouldn't have to interact with her much, so Jake and I went ahead and got married. The wedding went well. Kevin, who had introduced us, gave a speech, making it a wonderful ceremony. Thus began my life with Jake, which I believe was a happy newlywed life in the first year, with him helping around the house. However, as we entered the second year, Jake started coming home late, citing busy work schedules. Despite this, I supported him without suspicion. Occasionally, I met Susan, who would always suggest, why not work as a full-time employee? Why not get some qualifications? Growing tired of Susan's relentless comments, I one day said to Jake, Jake, I'm not comfortable around your mom. I respect her, but she always criticizes my job. Well, mom is from an older generation. You don't have to force a relationship. It's a relief you feel that way. He never forced me to get along with Susan or to listen to her. 
that was something I appreciated. One day, while I was working at home, my phone rang. It was Susan, whom I hadn't seen in a while. Hesitating at first, I answered a call, knowing I couldn't just ignore it. Hello, Susan, what's up? Megan, I wanted to talk to you about your work today. Susan, please, I've had enough. I... No, it's not that. I wanted to apologize. What? It turned out that Susan had come across an article I wrote in a travel magazine. She had researched and found out I was a well-known writer contributing to several magazines. I read your article. It was wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry. I may have looked down on the writing profession, but now that I see your talent and how well you're doing, I'm embarrassed. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Susan. I was surprised but also pleased that Susan had apologized. Aside from her opposition to my job, I had always respected and even admired her as a person. I felt a sense of relief as if our past disagreements were dissolving. So, to make amends, though it's not exactly an apology, I'll be in your town soon. How about we go out for lunch? Lunch? If you don't want to, it's totally okay, but I'd love to hear more about your work. No, Susan, I'm delighted. Please, let's have lunch together. And so, Susan and I agreed to meet for lunch at a restaurant in my town three days later. I wanted to tell Jake about it, but he was, as usual, busy with work and had left for a business trip the next morning. I wondered how Jake would react knowing that his mom and I had a pleasant lunch together while he was away. Surely, he would be happy. At that time, I naively thought so. On the day of the lunch with Susan, we chose a fancy restaurant, so I dressed up and headed to our meeting spot. Megan, over here. Susan waved at me with a smile, and as I approached, she apologized again. Sorry for all the trouble I've caused over your job. It's all right. Susan, let's enjoy the day together. I'm glad to hear you say that. Feel free to order whatever you like. Wow, the perks of being a CEO. I might as well enjoy something I usually wouldn't. Oh, Megan, you're such a fun person. Susan and I shared a laugh and headed into the restaurant. As we talked over lunch, I began to see the good in Susan that I hadn't noticed before. I developed a deep respect for her as a capable, strong yet kind person. After sharing her divorce story, Susan said, When I got divorced, I was so grateful to have my job. It really made me appreciate the importance of money and working. It's crucial for women to work. I deeply felt that. Susan, is that why you pushed me towards a full-time job? Yes, I didn't want you to struggle if something happened, but I see now, Megan, you're doing great. I'm glad you understand. I'll work hard, just like you, Susan. Just then, my phone rang. Ah, uh, it's Jake. I wonder what's up? Jake's on a business trip, right? Yes. I'll put it on speaker so you can hear, just in case. I switched to speakerphone and placed the phone on the table. Jake's voice came through. Megan, listen, something serious has happened. Aren't you supposed to be on a business trip? Well, the trip finished without a hitch, but something serious has come up. Actually, mom has collapsed. What? I looked up, shocked. Susan, sitting in front of me, also widened her eyes in surprise. So, 
You know the route back from Mightrip goes past the family home. I'm going to head there now and take care of mom. I glanced at Susan again. Then, Susan put her index finger to her lips, signaling me to keep quiet about her being with me. Understanding her intent, I decided to play along with Jake. So, is your mother okay? Should I come too? No, you don't like my mom, right? But... It's okay. Actually, my mom dislikes you too. She thinks you're a wife who doesn't listen. So, there's no need for you to come. Is that so? Okay, I'll hang up then. And so, the call from Jake ended. I was already suspicious. He was clearly lying. It was likely about something he couldn't tell me. Could it be an affair? As I clenched my fists, trembling, Susan said, So, Megan, what shall we do now? Susan, this is about him having another woman, isn't it? Unfortunately, it looks like he has someone else. But don't worry, Megan, I'm on your side. Strengthened by Susan's supportive words, I felt ready to uncover the truth. Later, Susan and I plan our next steps. First, we should check with his company. Prompted by Susan, I remembered Kevin, a mutual friend who worked at Jake's company. I messaged Kevin, need to talk, to which he replied, can we meet after work today? So, Susan and I went to the designated bar. Kevin was surprised to see Susan with me, but after we shared everything, he finally spoke up. I checked with Jake's department. He hasn't gone on any business trip. They said he's on paid leave. Of course, he was lying all along. I was hesitant to tell you this, Megan. Kevin looked back and forth between Susan and me. Encouraged by Susan to please tell us, Kevin seemed to steal himself for what he was about to reveal. Actually, it seems Jake has been getting pretty close with a female subordinate named Maria. She also took leave at the same time. A female subordinate? Yes, and apparently, this photo has been circulating around the office. Kevin showed us his phone, displaying a photo of Jake walking through a hotel district with a young woman. Thank you. Can I have this photo? Of course. Sorry, Megan. I felt responsible since I introduced you too, and I've been hesitant to say anything until now. It's not your fault, Kevin. By the way, do you know where this Maria lives? I... Well, I know a co-worker who might. Let me ask her. Kevin contacted a colleague right then, who informed us that Maria lived in a condo near the next station. Thank you, Kevin. You've been a big help. After parting ways with Kevin, Susan apologized sincerely to me. Megan, I'm truly sorry for my son's actions. It's okay, Susan. It's not your fault. I'll confront him with this evidence, and I'll make sure that woman takes responsibility too. Wait, Megan, this photo alone might be dismissed as them just walking together. We need more concrete evidence. Leave it to me. After saying that, Susan called a nearby detective agency. Incredibly, Susan offered to pay for them to secure decisive evidence. This agency was renowned for conducting investigations at an exceptionally fast pace. Megan, try to find out when he'll be back. Okay, he just messaged me. He'll be back the day after tomorrow. Susan nodded at me upon hearing this. Two days later, while I was at home, Jake returned. I'm home. Welcome back. How is your mother? She's calmed down a lot. 
Looks like I'll need to visit her more often. Is that so? That must be tough. She said she feels lonely and wants me by her side. As Jake said this, the door to the next room burst open. Who's feeling lonely and wants you by their side? Hua Im Mom. Jake nearly collapsed in shock. Susan and I approached him together. What's this? Why is mom here? I thought you two weren't getting along. Too bad, we've reconciled. Imagine our surprise when we were having lunch and got a call saying mom has collapsed. That, that can't be. Jake was at a loss for words as I confronted him. What have you been doing these last few days, and with whom? Jake turned pale and remained silent. Seeing no progress, I finally said, Your business trip was a lie, wasn't it? It was actually a romantic getaway with Maria, right? What? No, who's Maria? Jake denied everything, so I showed him the photo Kevin had given me of them in the hotel district. As expected, Jake responded with something like this. This was just after a drinking party. We just happened to walk by. She's just a subordinate, nothing more. Oh really? Then what's this? I showed him another photo. The photo clearly showed Jake coming out of Maria's house and kissing her at the doorstep. What is this? Pretending to be on a business trip, you went on a romantic getaway and couldn't stay away from your mistress, lying to me and hanging around at her place. This photo was obtained by your mother hiring a detective agency. Mom did. I can't believe it. Jake looked at Susan in disbelief, and suddenly, Susan slapped him hard. You idiot son, having such a good wife and doing something like this. Have you forgotten what caused your father and I to divorce? It was your father's affair, wasn't it? It's shameful that you only inherited that trait. Mom. I once talked about handing over my company to you. Remember, forget it. That's not all. Be prepared because I'm disowning you. That can't be. Realizing he had no way out. Jake knelt down before me. Megan, it was just a moment of weakness. Please forgive me. I promise to be a better husband from now on. That's when I firmly told him off. Don't be ridiculous. You lied and betrayed me, and now you expect me to forgive you just like that. We're getting a divorce, and I'll be taking a fair settlement for your affair. Eck. Jake was left speechless, groaning in despair, as Susan kicked him out of the house. The divorce between Jake and me was finalized later. Susan arranged for a lawyer, and I received a generous settlement, more than the standard amount for the divorce. I also demanded compensation from Maria, Jake's mistress. The affair and subsequent troubles led to Jake and Maria's breakup. Later, Susan generously gave me a large sum of money as compensation. She was relentless. It turned out that Jake's employment was through Susan's connections, and she told his company's president to fire him for his misconduct and disturbing company order by getting involved with a subordinate. Jake was dismissed from his job. With his savings depleted by the divorce settlement and disowned by Susan, Jake is now living in a rundown apartment, working as a day laborer without distinction between day and night. Even knowing this, I feel no sympathy. Serves him right is all I think. As for me, I moved with the settlement money and continued my work as a writer. Susan and I now address each other by our nickname, Meg and Sizzy, and sometimes travel together. There seems to be much more I can learn from her.
I cherish the supportive relationship with Susan and aim to live my life positively moving forward.